Good afternoon, everybody. I am delighted to welcome you to our Irish Institute for Catholic Studies public lecture today. And our speaker today is Professor Peter Finn. He's a Knight of St. Gregory. And Professor Finn is principal of St. Mary's University College, a university college of Queen's University in Belfast. And St. Mary's is a member of the International Federation of Catholic Universities. Professor Finn graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Geography from Queen's University Belfast in 1981 and he graduated with distinction because he won the Sarah M Holland Memorial Prize for receiving the highest marks in his final examinations. And he went on to do a Master's in Social Science in Queen's University Belfast, followed by a postgraduate certificate in education. After that, he went on to do a DMP in business education in the University of Ulster. And he worked for the Northern Ireland Curriculum Council before he joined St. Mary's in 1984. In 2008, he was appointed principal of St. Mary's University College. He serves on many international and national boards and he's chair of the Higher Education Subcommittee of the Ulster Council GAA. He has researched widely and he has researched particularly in the area of managing a Catholic education. And it's on that topic that we have invited him to speak today. So I'm delighted to welcome you, Professor Finn. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Tricia. And to yourself, Carla, and your colleagues in Limerick for inviting me to say a few words. Now, obviously, I'd prefer to be there in beautiful Limerick on such a lovely day, but um, that can't be. And we'll have to use this online and remote methodology, which in many respects, you know, gets things done. But um, it's not what we really want to be doing. Uh, the human and social interaction and the responsiveness that comes from being live and being in an institution is lost. But however, I'm happy to use this medium to share some information and some thoughts on the topic. And I'm going to take a very practical view of this, if, if that's OK. So I understand that Carla, who's in Boston, is going to help me with the various slides that I want to use. So perhaps you'd move to the to the next slide, Carly, if you wouldn't mind. Well, a few words about the key characteristics of St. Mary's University College. First of all, it is small. And that's, that's a very important point because in, it has certain advantages. It certainly helps the development of community, uh, but there are disadvantages from being a small institution. And we have ups, uh, offset some of those disadvantages by aligning with um, Queen's University in Belfast, a Russell Group University, and to make up for some of the, let's say, deficiencies that come from being small, uh, we have this relationship with Queen's, which works very, very effectively. Um, like Mary I, uh, St Mary's is a special institution. We are a member of the Guild HE. That's the UK body for small and specialist institutions. And uh, we specialise, as you perhaps know, initial teacher education and liberal arts. Now, every university in the world is going to claim to be distinctive, and we make that claim too. But within the context of Northern Ireland, it's true because we're the only Catholic institution of higher education in Northern Ireland. And our argument is that we are distinctive and inclusive, and I'll speak about that later on. Um, St Mary's is high performing if judged by various measures in the field of education. Um, education, of course, in the broadest sense, education, learning and teaching informed by research. But as a small institution with limited resources, uh, resort, I am quite clear that uh, research is not our strength and that we focus on what we do well, which is working with students in their learning and teaching and holistic development and aiding them on their pathway to a, a good career and a good life. And that's our focus. And of course, the college is located on the Falls Road in West Belfast. 
And context is very, very important when it comes to the many, many higher education institutions of, uh, in the Catholic tradition throughout the world. So we are in a particular place, in a particular time, and that sets, sets a context. Carrie, if you move to the next slide, I'm going to show people um, a photograph of the college. Um, there you have it. Uh, if you look at the, the foreground, this brings us right on to the Falls Road, which is a, a rather famous place. If you look at the background, you'll see that we have high density housing and we are located in effectively a, a relatively poor area. Um, this part of Belfast had a high degree of industrialization, particularly connected to the linen industry. But since the 1920s, we have had long term deindustrialization, leading to a lot of unemployment, a lot of poverty. Um, and that's part, to some extent, of the, the modern setup. Of course, the Falls Road will be very well known for the troubles which broke out here in 1969, and we thought it come to an end. In fact, in the photograph you're looking at, if you look on the right hand side, uh, about uh, one quarter of the way down, um, that's the interface between the Falls Road and the, well, not the Falls Road, Springfield Road and the, and the Shankill Road, where some of the violence took place um, last week. So we're about two miles from there. So this is a particular place in our world with characteristics that in many respects are, are very unique um, in, in the, and certainly in the, in the Western world. Um, however, I have to say this area has experienced in the last 20 years and certainly since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, a period of revitalization of growth and development largely around culture and education as the driving forces. And St Mary's has been very much a part of that story, which is a very good story. So whilst there certainly is a context of under, underlying underemployment, uh, unemployment, sorry, and um, certainly poverty, I have to say, uh, there's a good message too. And, and we're part of that, thankfully, which is something I'm going to speak about. Carly, if you just show us the next photograph. Obviously, in any Catholic university, the chapel or the church is, is a critical part of it. Um, so here we have a beautiful chapel that was built by the Dominican sisters and opened in 1900. Um, it's an environment which is used for all sorts of community religious events and, of course, for private prayer and other uh, student focused activities. On the right hand side, you can see one of the famous Harry Clark uh, School of Stained Glass Windows. Um, but it's a beautiful environment and it's a very important part of our campus, uh, which is well used. So if you'd move to the next of the various slides, um, I think it's always a good thing and maybe it's, I think it's Irish, but it's probably all over the world. You know, we try to make connections with people. We try to, um, you know, to bring us together in some way, even if we're apart. Um, so here's a couple of ideas I've put down here, which make a connection between St. Mary's University College in Belfast and Mary Immaculate College in, in Limerick. And I refer to letters of July 1898, and you're probably saying, well, what's that all about? Well, believe it or not, uh, two letters were dispatched um, by the Chief, Secretary, Chief Secretary's office in Dublin in July 1898 to the bishops here in the north and the bishop down in Limerick to announce the decision that the British administration in Ireland had decided to establish two teacher training colleges for women. Uh, one of them was to become St Mary's and the other was to become MIC. So actually these two institutions were brought together, were born, were created, whatever way you want to put it, on exactly the same day, penned um, by the Chief, Secretary's, Chief Secretary in Dublin Castle. And that is as strong a connection, I think, as you're possibly going to get. There were certainly, according to our records anyway, ongoing connections between the two colleges uh, because they were both part of the same all island, so to speak, uh, education system until partition. And of course, partition separated the institutions and there has been very little communication until recently, ever since partition and, and has impacted on virtually every aspect of life on this island. Um, I have to say that I was privileged to, to know 
uh, the deceased um, Professor Peter Kremen. Um, Peter invited me down to Limerick when he was president. Uh, he was a geographer like me. We got on exceptionally well. And, and the connection, a human connection that I've made with the MIC was very much facilitated by Padder. And then you had the awful loss of Professor Michael Hayes. Michael I met when he was over at uh, St Mary's University in Strawberry Hill in London. Uh, I got to know him there through various activities and he too invited me down to, to Limerick and uh, he was a huge loss to me. We met on many occasions. We exchanged many thoughts and ideas. In fact, we traveled together to Paris at one stage and had an outstanding meeting over there with the OECD head uh, of education. So I remember Michael very well. And I was I made the, made the important decision to go down to Mary I uh, for the service uh, for Michael at the time that he passed away. I don't know Professor Eugene Wall as well. He certainly was there in one of my visits. But what I've observed from a distance is that under the leadership of Professor Wall, um, this institution, MIC, has really taken off uh, in so many ways. And it's very clear that it's a very high quality institution that's growing and developing in all shapes and ways. And I commend the institution in that regard. Uh, a small little footnote in all of this is that these two, and they still are, we are very small and Mary I is small. Um, two institutions for teacher training established for women by the British government in 1898 um, ended up winning the two premier cups in Gaelic games, the Fitzgibbon Cup and the Sigerson Cup in 2017, which was amazing. I mean, St Mary's played UCD in the final, and that's a real David and Goliath um, match, so to speak. But that speaks volumes about the the communities that exist in these two institutions because success like this isn't just about the quality of the um, coaching or the quality of the players it's the extent to which there is a real strong sense of community and uh, there's no doubt in my mind that um, these institutions gain tremendous success by being very strong uh, community-based institutions um, I learned, by the way, after the event that the team from St Mary's who were playing these matches against Cork and, and, and UCD insisted upon being brought to the Knox Shrine before the game at which they won, and more importantly asked to go to this Knox Shrine after they had been victorious. So I'm taking that as a, a light-hearted um, sense of achievement in terms of our identity. So well done to the guys for, for that. I know that Mary I and ourselves are very strong into international outreach. Um, Holly is doing a fantastic job down there. We've been into this international outreach as well since as early as 1994, and it's a really big thing at St Mary's as it is at MIC. And post Brexit, we may well be working together on the Erasmus programme, uh, MIC facilitating St Mary's in terms of student mobility. And I also know we have connections in Irish medium, initial teacher education, and we're about to do a little, put a, put a bid for a research project uh, in, I think by this Friday. So I'm just saying those things to indicate that although we were you know, established at the same time, and uh, there has been a partition has sort of broken us apart in many respects, uh, there are connections and those connections are very important. So maybe if you'd move on then to the next one, um, which is at the core really in many respects of what I want to say. Um, and it's just a comment or an observation from where I'm sitting about Catholic schools and universities. Um, of course, these are widespread in the world. And very often this is not known by people of other traditions or indeed by other university managers, leaders, whatever. The extent to which schools and also universities are widespread in the world. and. It's not my purpose this afternoon to get into the underlying philosophies and, and, and ideas behind Catholic education, but this statement uh, from the Vatican Council, the Sacred Ecumenical Council, has considered with care how extremely important education is in the life of man and how it influence, oh, has influenced grows in the social progress of this age. This declaration, this document, to me is absolutely critical in signalling a big change, so to speak, in the direction of 
Catholic education, broadly speaking, certainly in schools and certainly in universities. Um, in many respects, but not exclusively, um, the change has been one from these institutions not being universities and schools for Catholics, but rather Catholic schools and universities with a distinctive philosophy and ethos. Um, and that's very different. Uh, and certainly the, 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 the developments that have taken place and emerged from the Second Vatican Council with respect to higher education in the Catholic tradition have been very, very immense, an enormous change. And the change from for Catholics to institutions with a distinctive philosophy and ethos. Now, I mean, the teachings of the, of the church on Catholic education and the various academic literature on these matters are vast. So to summarize in a very short few sentences, um, I try, uh, but from my point of view, um, the Second Vatican Council signals as far as universities and indeed schools are concerned, a focus on the human person and a focus on holistic development of that human person. It focuses on the power of education to be transformative. It makes the connection between education and social justice. It firmly states that gospel values should be at the heart of education. And it also makes a big plea for high quality provision. And when we have to see this period of the Vatican Council and thereafter uh, as a period of great change from what went before. Um, specifically with regard to higher education institutions, um, it is probably true to say that many Catholic universities and colleges were very teaching focused before the Second Vatican Council and this declaration. And there has been a big change since then as these universities have come into the more Humboldt uh, structures of higher education where research is central and research is so important uh, to the institutions. Um, we have at least two uh, Catholic universities in the top 100 universities ranked in the world, that being Notre Dame and uh, the Catholic University of Leuven and, ve and other very fine uh, universities which are research intensive. A small place like St Mary's is not going to be research intensive, of course, it's not possible for a small institution like ours to do so, but I make sure in my role as the leader of the institution that our teaching, which is of a very high quality, is research informed and that we do certainly have a research strategy and research objectives. To the right hand side, you'll see for some 20 years now, we have been producing a Catholic Schools Ethos Journal. Um, schools are very important to us, the connection to those schools. This goes out to the schools twice a year. Uh, from St Mary's and it's, it's one way in which we keep a connection between ourselves as a Catholic provider of higher education and schools. So if we'd move on then to, to, the, to the next one, I'm just going to set out some context very quickly about the institution. It was established, um, although the, the letter came in 1898, the institution was actually then established by the Dominican Sisters in 1900. Uh, it remained Dominican for a large part of the history of the college, but in the mid 1980s, it came under the trusteeship of the Diocese of Don and Connor. So that's that's where we sit as a diocesan higher education institution. We have a memorandum of agreement with Queen's University on collaborative academic provision. As I said earlier, it is our view that the institution is too small at just over a thousand students to really function as best we can academically. So we have very much aligned ourselves with Queen's University, adopted all their um, processes and methodologies around quality assurance. And, and, and in a sense, that's an important aspect of how we survive and develop as a small institution. We're funded by a grant from the Department of a Regional Administration. And I say that because Mary I is in a sovereign state. And I think we have to make the difference between how a, a higher education inter institution interacts with the government of a sovereign state and how the likes of ourselves interacts with a government department of a regional administration vast difference and of course we're funded to some extent from student fees. 
St Mary's is a recognised provider of higher education in the United Kingdom, approved by the QAA. So that's a recognition in our own right as a higher education institution, even though we have taken the decision to be academically connected to Queen's. 89% uh, of our staff self-designate as Catholic and 95% of our students self-designate as Catholic. That's important in the north of Ireland because these these statistics are processed by government and we are held to account for the extent to which um, we have a commitment to increase the number and percentage of staff who are other than Catholic and likewise with students. And we engage with government uh, on that matter. So that's some sort of context. It's difficult because, you know, there's a mixture of things going on here. It's a publicly funded institution. It's private by designation by the Organization of National Statistics. It is aligned with a secular university and yet it's still Catholic. And that's what we have to manage uh, and define the space within all of this for St Mary's to express itself as a Catholic higher education institution in the global family of Catholic universities and colleges. So if we could move to the to the next one. I'm just going to set out here some of the things I am going to speak about. Um, I'm going to use this word intentionally. So you know, first and foremost, St Mary's is an institution of higher education, but it has this label Catholic. And it's certainly our view and my view that that has to be an intentional statement, something that's not um, just taken for granted. We have to go out of our way to be such. And therefore, I'm going to say a few words about the trusteeship, which is obviously with the local diocese, with identity, which we have to promote and plan for and develop. I'm going to speak about aspects of leadership and governance, ethos and management, partnerships and dialogue. Now, I mean, why am I doing this? Well, I suppose from my own point of view, uh, in the past, when the college was led by, let's say, a priest or by a nun, um, it was very clear and self-evident that St Mary's and all it did was within the Catholic tradition. Um, my own view is that when the institution is led by a member of the laity and by other senior members of staff who are also lay members, um, we have to be more explicit about this. We have to be more deliberate, let's say, in how we go about communicating what we are. Uh, and that's what we have done. Um, we've been more deliberate and more directive in terms of setting out our stall, uh, not in any aggressive sense, not in any sense other than to let people know what St Mary's is, what's it about, how is it different, why is it different, and how we do things differently, even if we do those many things in collaboration with others. So that's the sort of agenda I hope to speak about for the next 10 minutes. So maybe you'd like to you'd move on to the next slide there. It goes without saying that there are huge challenges in having that label Catholic to higher education institution. Um, there is a prevailing um, technocratic and economic rationale for, um, for, for education. I'm sorry, I've got that wrong in my uh, presentation, but what I really meant was uh, technocratic and economic rationale, which is all over the world and very different from the Declaration on Catholic Education as set out uh, at the Second Vatican Council. I mean, how different can these things be? Um, we know about relativism and secularization in society. That challenges us. An ongoing erosion of the Christian tradition. The mass media and social media very often challenge any organization or indeed very any individual who promotes a Christian Catholic way of living. Uh, and that's a challenge for us. Within the north of Ireland, there is a particular problem when people label an institution like St Mary's as an institution which is promoting segregation. That is a very bad word, as we know, it's very bad connotations. And yet recently I heard um, an education professor from a university in the Republic of Ireland describing school, school experience of those who do not go to integrated schools as a segregated educational experience. And that's very difficult for us to accept uh, for all sorts of reasons. But to, to label a form of education as a segregated form of education 
is a dreadful, dreadful statement and one we have to deal with and deal with the idea of conformity, the idea that certainly up here there are people who would want to bring about a oneness to things where in fact it's a very diverse society and that diversity should be celebrated and not corralled into some sort of conformity. Um, one thing that's very big, and anyone working in higher education will know there's a huge burden of, burden of compliance on publicly funded institutions of higher education. And that can take away simply by the fact that it takes away valuable financial resources and very valuable time. That can take away from the mission and the core mission of being a Catholic university in the first place um, because there's no getting away from compliance. And I often have difficulties with some of my academic staff about this, that we do have to invest in areas of college life, in human resources, in financial management, and, and in, in, in registration, to be able to ensure that we are in compliance with government regulations. I, I look at American universities and I say, where does the money come from for vice presidents, for um, mission effectiveness, or, or the wonderful campus ministries they have? If I could take the money that I'm putting into compliance and put it into mission effectiveness and campus ministry, I'll be a very happy person. Um, these institutions, well, certainly in the United Kingdom, depend so much on the student demand for places, and that's something we have to work on all the time to ensure that we have a high level of demand. But in, in regard to those challenges, um, our objective is to essentially rejuvenate and revitalize our Christian community continuously. And that's what we try to do. And the chair of our Board of Governors is Bishop Noel Trainer, the Bishop of Don and Connor. And that's something that he is doing within the Diocese of Don and Connor in his role as the Bishop. And in a sense, that falls to us here as well to do something very similar, to be rejuvenating, revitalizing our Christian community, to address those challenges. Uh, and to, in a sense, continue to develop and survive despite the challenges that, that exist. Understanding, of course, that challenges, has, has challenges have existed for church institutions for all time, so it's nothing new. So if we could move on then to the, the next slide, which addresses leadership and governance. The main point I want to make here is that I'm certainly of the view that we have to be very intentional in regard to the leadership and governance of the college as it applies to its Catholic identity. You know, what I mean by this is that we just can't take things for granted. We can't assume that developments will take place. We have to ensure that our mission statement is very clear as to our Catholic identity. We have to ensure that the Board of Governors have an oversight of the Catholic identity of the institution, as well as all the other areas required by corporate governance. We have to ensure that our strategic plan puts identity as one of the key areas of development. And in our plan, it does. We have to go beyond, um, I suppose, you know, wishful thinking about ethos and actually state what our ethos is and to have an ethos statement that we can stand over. Um, we shouldn't be shying away from symbols and traditions uh, because they're important. They're important visual elements of our identity. So the image to the right hand side of the older part of the campus here has a flag and that flag has a, a cross on it. And that's a symbol and it's a, and it's a statement. And we're quite clear about that. Unfortunately, at times we've had to be very defensive and very protective of our institution. Um, that's unfortunate. Uh, that's because there are individuals, certainly in this society, who would desperately love to see this institution closed and merged into the university and to put an end to Catholic higher education, particularly as it applies to the education and training of teachers. So at times we have had to be defensive and protective. And that sometimes cannot look terribly pleasant, but it has to be done. But what we really want to do is to have a vision of the Christian message, which is about its real meaning and it's relevant for today's world. I mean, that last bullet point is what we want to be about. Uh, we want to be presenting the positive side, 
the positivity of the Christian message as it applies not just to Catholics and Christians, but to this society as a whole. And that's what we focus our attention on. As I said, at times we have to be defensive and protective, and we do that, but that's not our raison d'etre. Our raison d'etre is to present a very positive vision of the Christian message. So we could move on to the next slide. Um, we're looking here at this statement, ethos and management. And what I'm saying here is that the climate, the character, the characteristics of the institution are something that has to be managed like all other aspects of the institution. This is not something which can be left to its own devices or to develop in some osmosis way. No, this has to be thought out and planned and put into the planning cycle of the institution to keep the identity, which is Catholic, alive and fruitful. So we have a strong college liturgy program. Uh, there are key points in the year which when we celebrate collectively as a community. Um, we have laid aside a, a one hour on a Thursday, every Thursday throughout the year, when there is mass for students and staff if they want to attend. No lectures are allowed to take place at that time, no meetings and no other activities. So that's our space once a week on a Thursday afternoon. And we leave a space afterwards for some student societies to develop their work. We have a human society of students who uh, contribute to the liturgy and who do good work uh, in the Christian sense throughout the college, and we support those, that society. Uh, that's important. These are people who have volunteered to be part of a, a very good venture as far as I'm concerned, and they are supported. Like all universities, we provide pastoral care for staff and students, but I do believe we go the extra mile here. Uh, this is a really important part of what we're about. This is a very, very important part of what we do. I would be very, very annoyed if our level of pastoral care for staff and students was not seen to be at the very highest level. Obviously, we have a great range of uh, programmes of study, but to tell you that religious studies is the most popular subject in our Bachelor of Education degree, and it's the most popular subject in our Bachelor of Arts degree in Liberal Arts. Um, and that's important. We have very large numbers of students who are taking religious studies as part of their undergraduate programs. Um, we have a, a religious education program for postgraduates post and undergraduates, which is again very popular and uh, leads to the qualification to teach in a Catholic primary school. Um, so the programs uh, have a strong Christian tradition in them. We encourage students to engage in service learning through volunteering, and we have a special office for that purpose. Inclusion is really important here. Uh, in the United Kingdom, we talk about widening participation. Uh, this is an institution which would be a high performer in widened participation, uh, particularly students from low income backgrounds and those with various forms of disabilities. We'd be right up there in terms of the, the percentage of students who fall into those categories, whom we support from they arrive until they leave. And also the important aspect of reputation, that the institution has a reputation for being Catholic, for being caring, for being inclusive. And reputation is really important in the modern world and it's something we work hard to maintain and sustain over time. So if you could move on to um, the next one, which is partnerships and dialogue. I mean, the Vatican, Second Vatican Council and all aspects of Catholic education will talk about outreach. Uh, we are no longer in our secluded world. Uh, we are part of the bigger world. We're part of the mainstream, so to speak. So this institution works in various different ways with the diocese, uh, various diocesan events that are held here and we cooperate with the diocese in, in, in a numerous ways. We obviously work with Queen's University, albeit a secular university, but we work closely with, it, with that. Um, in terms of the local community, um, that's a really important aspect of who and what we are. Really, really important aspect. Um, 
maybe one of the two defining characteristics of the institution. Um, I'm going to emphasize two areas. Um, we have a special relationship with a local group here which is involved in, um, re I suppose, reforming and revitalizing this area. It's called the West Belfast Partnership Board. And uh, we put a lot of effort into our partnership with that board in terms of organizing um, lots of activities which promote particularly, particularly support, support for schools and, and student learning. And then we have a very large program with another cultural organization, Fela on Fubble, the Festival of the People, which is held here in August. Uh, some 20,000 people will come to our campus in August to various activities which are held here. And that's us outreaching. We have a diversity and mutual education program with uh, Stranmillis University College, which uh, is a state controlled uh, teacher education institution. We obviously have great partnerships with schools for placement learning. Um, all of our liberal arts students undertake internships. So we work with a whole variety of different providers in the world of business and uh, various other types of organizations to provide that. Um, we work with the police service of Northern Ireland in a variety of different ways and other statutory agencies. We have international connections like, your, like Mary I. And the point I'm making here is that as a Catholic institution of higher education, we have a mission to be in the mainstream. We have a, a mission to be part of the University of Queen's, part of the local community, connected to schools, connected to the various statutory agencies, including the police service, connected internationally. Uh, there is no place uh, for a Catholic institution of higher education um, off to the side somewhere. Um, remote from what's going on in the, in the real world. We have to take our tradition and all its strengths and some of its weaknesses and work with others for the common good. And, and that's what we do. So I have a couple of photographs to finish off with. So if you'd like to have you go to the, the next one, um, you'll know this gentleman to the right, the former Taoiseach Leo Varadkar, visiting the college here a couple of years ago for the opening of that festival to which I, which I spoke about. Um, now, the point I'm making here is that as a Catholic institution of higher education, uh, we have to be part of the mainstream. And this is just a manifestation of that. Meeting with the Taoiseach, facilitating the opening of a festival, 20,000 people come to our campus. And that's critical from my point of view of being part of the mainstream. If you move to the next one, we have an excellent relationship with the Farmington Institute, which is based in Oxford University. And here I have an annual meeting every year with a wonderful man, the Reverend David Cooper, who's a Methodist minister. And this is where we, along with the Farmington Institute, we facilitate teachers to be able to come out of school for a six month period or sometimes longer to work on the production of learning materials to teach religious education in schools. Um, but the partnership and the dialogue we have with Farmington and in particular with the Reverend Cooper is a really enriching experience for us and something that, that we are very proud of and very proud of that dialogue that takes place between us. And then if you move to the next one, this is a photograph taken on the night of a commencement ceremony we had a couple of years ago. The bishop in the middle is, um, well, he was at that stage an auxiliary bishop in Down and Connor, Bishop Anthony Farquhar. But very interesting, our commencement speaker that night was a member of the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, Sammy Douglas, MLA. Now, Sammy is one of the greatest supporters of St Mary's. Uh, that, that, and, I, and I really mean that in various political environments, such as the Northern Ireland Assembly and various places. It's, it was invariably Sammy who stood up for us when we were attacked by other people. Uh, and that's because one, Sammy is a Christian, and two, he understands the importance of having a high quality institution of higher education in an area which has suffered economically and indeed suffered back through the troubles and deeply appreciates the work that we do. So that's important that that dialogue continues across the political divide. Now we're not involved in politics as a university institution, but we are certainly in dialogue with a, a wide range of um, politicians across different political parties 
as I say, for the common good, what we can do as an institution or what we can do in collaboration with other institutions of higher education or indeed with all the various agencies that I have outlined. So we could move on and we are very close to the end. Um, hope, the value of hope. This is a very nice statement from an encyclical letter. Hope in the world of education makes us believe that it is always possible to develop a new, the ability to go out of ourselves towards the other. And that's what I certainly read into the mission of Catholic education as set out in that declaration arising from the Second Vatican Council, to go out of ourselves towards the other. And then I have an image here, uh, which many of you will recognize, um, Paulo Ferreira, uh, making the point that education does not change the world, but education changes people and people change the world. And many of the people that we educate become teachers. And certainly we have a very strong view that teachers have an enormous capacity to change the world in the wonderful professional work that, 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 that they do. So if you move to the next one and the final one, that's a bit of room for discussion. That um, image sits outside our college on the Falls Road, St. Mary's University College, the Irish dimension, Cholester Ulskola Neapwara, and then a statement, faith in educational opportunity defines both our history and our future. So there we go. Um, slightly over time, I think, but maybe not too bad. So I will stop at this point. Thank you for your, your interest. Uh, and I'll hand back now to the Institute in Limerick.